My name is Maryam. This is how I found the truth. I grew up in an Islamic country where we had to follow the Islamic rules, especially in public, but my own family were not really practicing those religious Islamic rules. Even from very young age, from my childhood, I always wanted to know God and I wanted to have a close relationship with Him. I wanted to know what the truth is and I really wanted to be able to communicate with God and to be able to hear His voice. And I remember after a long time, you know, trying to find the truth, trying to follow some of these rules and trying to do some research on my own, I realized that none of them could really help me um, to get close to God. I felt like it was just me um, talking to God, trying to have relationship with God, but I wasn't receiving anything from Him. There was a time that I was just so frustrated and I was so tired of following Islamic rules or religious rules or trying to even find the truth this way. I was around 17 when I completely stopped doing or following any religious rules. At nights, I would look up into the sky and I would, I would just talk to God. I didn't know who he was. I didn't know the truth about him. I would just talk to him sometimes for an hour in my own language, Farsi and I was asking him to show me the truth, and I was asking him to communicate with me and talk to me. And one day, my sister came home. She had a little booklet in her hand. Uh, the name on that booklet was, His Name is Wonderful. And she just gave that little booklet to me. It was, I think, maybe 20, 30 pages. And she said, you know, this is about Christianity. If you want, you can read it. But don't read the last page because it's, uh, it's the conversion prayer for those who want to become Christians. And I went to my room, I closed the door, and I remember I sat on the floor and I started reading that little booklet. It took me three hours to finish that because I remember from the first page, from the first word, God was speaking to my heart. I believe that day, Jesus was really there. I could feel a strong presence all over me in my room. And I remember I was just crying for three hours and I was reading every single word in that book. This was the first time really I heard anything about Christianity. I believe that Jesus himself revealed the truth to me that day. You know, when I got to the last page of that booklet, I had no doubt that Jesus is God. I prayed the, the conversion prayer. I gave my heart to Jesus. And that day, God really changed my heart. I could feel Jesus' love in my heart, and I could give the same love to other people. After I became a Christian, I became involved in the church in Iran. I had so much passion to share the message of salvation uh, to people, to my family members, to my friends, and to some strangers. When you experience the love of God and when you find the truth and you know that majority of people in your country, especially your family members, are living in darkness and they don't know the truth, uh, you want to share the same message with them because you experience that love, you experience that amazing presence of God and you want to share the same thing with other people. Um, so for, for years, um, really, when I was going to Assembly of God Church, I was involved in evangelizing. And that was really the main thing that would make me happy, evangelizing people and talking to them about Jesus and inviting them to church. Um, but after years, um, I met uh, my best friend, Marzia, and we qu quickly found out that we both had the same heart and we both um, really uh, were passionate to talk to people about Jesus. We knew that most people don't have access to Bible um, because it's forbidden in Iran. You can't sell Bibles in bookstores. That's why we decided to uh, start our mission by distributing Bibles and putting God's words in people's hands. I remember during almost three years, we distributed uh, around 20,000 Bibles. At the same time, we were talking to people in the streets. We had house churches in our own apartments. We would invite people, um, including friends, um, 
strangers really whom we met like maybe once or twice in the street um, we would invite them to our house churches and we would share the gospel with them and it was um, just amazing for years that we were serving the Lord in Iran we did not even have one bad experience So Qom, um, or in Farsi we say Qom, is really the center of uh, faith for Shia Muslims. And uh, one day my friend Marzi and I decided to go there and take some Bibles because we were really distributing Bibles, not only in Tehran, but in some other cities. When we got there, uh, there was this um, gentleman standing there and he offered us to wear some chador. And he said, well, in order to be able to enter this place, you need to wear these chadors. And I completely forgot where I was. I just told him that we are not Muslims, we are Christians and we passed. And I remember after we passed, we went to the bathrooms and we heard that the same person was shouting and he came after us and he was uh, shouting, two Christian girls, two Christians get, Christian girls, where are you? And we, we just didn't show ourselves. And after that, we came, uh, we came out and we actually used those chadors we wore them and we went inside that um, the holy place for Muslims. It's really um, one of the holiest place for them in Iran. And we just walked and prayed. We put some small New Testament um, in some corners. We were hoping and we were praying uh, for the people who were coming to that place because most Muslims, even though they don't know the truth, uh, some of them are not really religious, they are not prejudiced Muslims, they just um, are looking for the truth. And we were hoping that when they come to that place to, to find God, to talk to God, um, they could find some of those Bibles and God could speak to them. During all those years that we were evangelizing and talking to people about Jesus, God really protected us and nothing happened to us until that day we were arrested and we went to prison. months before going to prison, we both had a feeling that something was changing. I did not have the same desire in my heart to share the gospel with people. And I was so upset why this, this, I don't have the same passion, the same fire that I used to have. Some days I would just try, uh, you know, to go out and share some Bibles with people. I remember one day I took some Bible, about seven, eight, a New Testament. And I remember I went out, a few hours they came back. I couldn't share even one Bible. But later we realized in prison and they told us that they were watching us for months before. Uh, they came to our apartment to arrest us and we realized that God was really protecting us. Uh, it was in March 2009 that um, we got arrested. Some security officers, uh, they called Marzie um, on her phone early in the morning. They told her that they, were, they wanted her to go there for a different reason, but later she realized that it was really because of um, her faith and because of our activities. When um, they came back, I was in the apartment. They took everything that was related to Christianity in our apartment. They took the Bibles that we had. We had hundreds of Bibles, but we had thousands in the basement and we were just praying that God would protect those Bibles. And he did, um, they, they couldn't find them. They just found some hundreds of Bibles that we had in our apartment. And they just took both of us with everything that they could get from our apartment to the security police. And after that, we were in different police stations, detentions, and eventually we ended up to Evin prison. I remember the first interrogation, our interrogators uh, threatened us to physical torture. Uh, Marzi and I went back to this dark cell in the basement, which was, which was really awful. The first day that we got arrested, we were in that police station until midnight, really. And we had separate in, uh, interrogations uh, with that interrogator who was trying to put pressure on us and threaten us. The condition was horrible. When we got there, it was midnight and there was just this guard who gave us some wet blankets. They smelled strongly of urine. And later we realized that most women who go to that detention are addicted and prostitutes and use those blankets as, as a bathroom. And there was no bed. 
it was a concrete floor. The guard told us to grab some of these blankets and sleep somewhere. The only thing that really helped us uh, to overcome that shock and fear and those threats was really God's presence. We would just pray in tongues and ask the Holy Spirit to give us power and the strength uh, to stand that difficult condition in prison. There were so many young girls, as young as like 14, 15, uh, who were coming to that prison and they were so lost and they wanted to hear the truth. They were so open. Most of those women were just victims of the Iranian regime. Some of them would tell us that how they were abused um, during their childhood and then the society, how um, the government and, you know, it really the society and Islam destroyed their life. And um, they it treated them as a second class citizen. And, you know, because in, in, Iran, in Iran, really, women um, do not have the same value as men. They are treated as second class citizens. Before going to prison, we were, we were going after those people. We were going after especially prostitutes because we had a house church for them. But now we were with them and they, every day they would bring more people into that detention and we could share the message with them. We could pray with them and it was an amazing experience of how God used us as, as a tool to give his message to those people. But another heartbreaking um, thing that we really experienced in prison was seeing small children. Like when we went to Evin prison the first night, we were so surprised to see kids really um, from two to maybe five, six years old. Those kids were sometimes abused, even physically, by other prisoners. And they were just, they were not getting any attention. And the, the kids imagined that they were born in prison. One day I was in the yard, there was a small yard in Evin prison. And one of those kids saw for the first time a bird in the sky. And he was so shocked and he was just screaming that, and pointing out to that bird. It was so heartbreaking, you know. It just reminds us, you know, um, that we should really appreciate everything that we have um, in free societies that some, some people don't really have access to. There was just one particular day um, that I was in um, the solitary confinement of 209. Uh, they transferred both me and Marzia to that section. I was with another political prisoner and we were in that place for 40 days. It was just a small room and um, there was a light that was on all day and night. They would just come and bring some food for us um, twice a day or three times a day. We had to spend all of, all of the time in that cell waiting for them to come and take us for interrogation, which um, most of the time was something between seven to eight hours. And I remember one day I was just, um, I think it was a day that we uh, came back from one of the interrogations. Um, I went to the cell, my cellmate was there, she was around 50, 60 years old, and I just felt completely blank. I couldn't feel God's presence. And it was really the first time after I gave my heart to Jesus, that I couldn't feel anything. I couldn't feel God was there. I couldn't hear his voice. And I think that was the, the scariest moment in my life. Uh, nothing was scarier than that. And I just, I didn't know what to do. And I felt like I couldn't breathe. And I remember just, I lay down and I felt like I needed to sing. And in that, you know, in that security building, you are not really allowed to even speak loudly. Um, but I felt like I needed to sing like some worship songs. And I started, I remember I started with singing in tongues and then sang some worship songs loudly, you know. And my, I remember at the beginning, my cellmate was so scared and she was saying, Mariam, please be quiet. They will come and they will punish you. But I just, I kept singing. And I, I remember after singing like maybe for uh, 10 minutes, I could feel that th that cell was full of God's presence. And later my cellmate told me that I could feel the presence of God. And she even asked me to teach her some of those worship songs. I learned something that day and I, God really spoke to me and he really reminded me that I am always with you even though you don't feel my presence. From the beginning, it was really God's strength and power that helped us to stand on our faith. Uh, without his presence, you know, I couldn't stand even one day in prison. If you 
seek the truth. If your heart, really deep in your heart, you want to know the truth about God, He has so many different ways to show you to show you the truth. God is a powerful God and no one and no other government, no agents can stop him. He is powerful and he can speak to your heart. We can go through so many different forms of persecution, but his presence and um, his words really strengthen us and helps us keep moving. My name is Mariam and I found the truth.